Chair, um, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on this part one of the Vulnerable Children's Bill, which unfortunately the Greens are unable to support. The Greens believe that New Zealand can provide a society where every child can thrive. And this bill and the process of the white paper and the green paper for us were an opportunity for public debate on how to deliver on that society for our children. And we know that many of the NGOs and advocates for children participated in that process with that vision as well. We are a wealthy country, in effect. We have a lot of resource in this country. We can actually afford to deliver that for every one of our children. And the end result of delivering that for every one of our children will be a society that can grow, that can respond to the challenges that are in front of us and be the best that it can be. Because our children are, in a sense, our future, as has been said in many a pop song. And this bill, sadly, does not deliver that vision or that opportunity. And we're, in fact, worried that by the narrow scope of it, it will actually interfere in the ability to deliver for the children, the very few children that it is named to deliver for. So, in effect, it's saying that um, it, this part of the bill will support the government's setting of priorities for improving the well-being of vulnerable children and gives the government the ability to define vulnerability for the purposes of this work. And we've had indications from the government that their definition and understanding of vulnerability is quite a narrow definition. And we're being told that's about us having limited resources and that needing to be channeled to those most in need. We challenge that premise. And that, we, that has been said throughout the process, Minister. You may not have said it yourself in this debate, but it has been said. And if it is not the case, then why aren't we not broadening out and actually putting in place what the regional public health um, has noticed or has noted in their submission is a much wider approach in terms of taking a public health prevention approach, which has internationally been proven to be the most effective approach at delivering for children who are at risk. Why are we implementing a policy and process that is in conflict with the basic principles of Huana Ora and a prevention, a public health prevention approach? Why are we doing that, Minister? I'm hoping you can explain that to us, because I have not heard it through any of the submissions or the discussion. Why this need to focus on such a narrow, narrow group that has so much risk of missing so many children and misses the fundamental causes and drivers of harm and does nothing to create safe environments? And we know that actually creating safe environments is going to be what delivers for our children in the long term. Just leaving it up to state interventions to intervene when there is harm already is basically saying we give up. We do not give up and there is no need to give up. This country can afford to deliver a different future for our children, and sadly, this bill doesn't do it. I'd also note that the um, Targo University raised concerns about the notice of this, um, their public health department, noticed a deep concern that the definition of vulnerability now lies in the hands of the responsible minister, rather than a broader definition that was based on the community analysis. And we have heard from many submitters that actually there is an understanding that all children are vulnerable by their nature. They are dependent on others. And it is up to us to create that safe environment and safe families for them to be able to grow and thrive in recognition of that vulnerability. And I would also like to just take issue a little with the Minister's response to Jacinda Ardern. And, and I get the passion that the Minister conveys 
around the importance of addressing, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, of addressing um, sexual abuse and abuse, physical violence against children, because that is an issue I am deeply passionate about and have spent much of my life working on those issues, as have others in this House. But I will point out that. In effect, the government has edited out, through this process, any mention of domestic violence. And we know there are different understandings of domestic violence and incorrect understandings of the nature of domestic violence across our different ministries, including um, SIFs. And that the Family Violence Death Review noted in their submission that there is an issue within our systems of recognising lethality. And there is another issue of passing on the concerns that are there. And then yet another issue about getting a response, even when those times of concerns do manage to get passed on. And that they work with SIFs a lot and find it very difficult due to a lack of resources. They believe they need more time and training and more staff. This, we have not heard of any extra resourcing in terms of supporting this. And that they've said that we need to fund time to meet and build trust so that this um, approach by the government talks about a lot of collaboration between the ministries, which is essential. We need to have that. And we, the State Services Act, I really think, does need a review in terms of breaking down those silos across government. But we also need to fund that time to build trust and understanding between those agencies so that everyone is talking the same language and is able to go to somebody when they have a concern. And there is nothing that we've heard that's saying that that is going to be delivered. And when we're not funding the delivery of the core mechanisms that are in this, to ensure that they're going to work, then actually it's hard to see what's different from window dressing. And our children deserve better than that. We have enough resource in this country to deliver a better future for them. And it's not okay that so many of them are at risk at the moment. And we've been hearing, I've just been hearing, and I do want to go back to the point around domestic violence in particular, because we have seen a um, reduction in funding for the core response agencies. We know, we have, Minister, um, that the library here's figures show that the funding to women's refuge has dropped by just over 30% over the last three years. We've seen that the stopping violence programs for the um, typically fathers who are seeking to get treatment has also dropped by 16% over the last three years. Minister, this is around the point of vulnerability and the point of domestic violence because over half of the children who are, have cis notifications attached to them are coming from families that are, in, are violent and the, where there is domestic violence present. And yet, this bill does not acknowledge that reality. And unless we acknowledge that reality and actually take on domestic violence head on, name it, get the understandings of it shared across the relevant ministries, then actually we're in danger of putting these kids at risk because we're in danger of taking them off protective parents, which is happening all too often. And we're still hearing those stories, sadly, coming out of the community of children losing both of their parents because the state can't understand and support the role of the protective parent. And it's so hard for those fathers to access the support that they need to change their attitudes, behaviours and beliefs to become good fathers. And this bill, sadly, again, does nothing to deliver on that. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.